Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another one of our free webinars on safety and health training. Uh, my name is Dave Medeiros. I am the president of the Chesapeake Region Safety Council. We are a regional independent chapter of the National Safety Council, and our mission is to educate and influence people to prevent accidental injury and death. In addition to being a chapter of the National Safety Council, we are the lead partner of the Mid-Atlantic OSHA Training Institute Education Center, which means in Region 3, in OSHA's Region 3 of the country, we are authorized to uh, provide the numbered OSHA Training Institute courses, such as OSHA 500, OSHA 510, OSHA 511. You see all those different numbered OSHA courses and you want to know where to get them, you can get them through us because we are an OTI Ed Center. Uh, another note on that is uh, we have been working through the Department of Training and Education to uh, uh, conduct a pilot program on doing virtual instructor-led training courses, which would be those number OTI Ed Center courses. Uh, and we've been doing a number of those. Uh, if you check our website, if you want to get one or you need something, and you're thinking about doing a numbered OTI Ed Center course and you're concerned about uh, you have virus concerns and you want to try to do a little distance learning, check our website out, www.chesapeakesc.org, and you might just find one of those OTI Ed Center courses that you need available through a virtual instructor-led training program. All right. So, Without further ado, I want to uh, introduce to you Tom Thorson. Tom Thorson is going to talk to you today about trenching and excavation. I've known Tom for a number of years. He's an excellent instructor and a great resource. Tom's got 20 years with the Maryland Occupational Safety and Health uh, Organization. He's uh, currently serving, serving as a regional compliance supervisor. Before that, he had 16 years working in the uh, nuclear power industry, traveling around looking at nuclear power plants. And then he spent some time, probably three or so years, doing some environmental remediation work up at Aberdeen Proving Grounds in Maryland. So Tom is very qualified. He's a great instructor. And I can guarantee you, you're going to get a lot of good information out of this program today. So without further ado, I am going to turn it over to Tom Thorson. Tom, take it away. Thank you, Dave. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, this will be a little strange for me talking to as many people as I'm talking to, and I see nothing but a computer. So uh, we'll go with this. And uh, the topic today we're going to talk about is a little bit about excavation safety. We'll hit some of the general principles and regulations for excavation safety. Plus, uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, one of the events that occurred uh, that most uh, actually inspected there was a fatality that occurred uh so we'll kind of go into a little bit of that <clears throat> but uh just uh for the first and important note uh basically any part of this presentation is for informational purposes only uh it is not to be used as training or not to take the place of any training that uh, you are required by an employer to do so uh just for general information there so trenching and excavation is what we're going to call uh, talk about today. And I put this picture in here basically because it truly is a belief of mine uh, that if you are digging a trench, you are digging yourself a grave if you refuse to do the things that are required by law to protect yourself. Uh, that being the cave-in protections, the access egress, uh, all of the things that that are required. So. Uh, let's try not to be in this position uh, at any point in time, if possible. So, so we talk a little bit about uh, excavation, injury, and death. It's one of the most hazardous construction operations out there that we have, uh, along with falls uh, being the number one. The excavation fatalities is uh, up there in, in death rate also. Uh, most accidents occur in trenches anywhere between 5 and 15 feet deep. That is the majority of trenches that are dug are in that uh, general depth range. So uh, that's what we're looking at there. Uh, no warning before a cave-in. You're not going to hear a, a whistle, a bell, a horn, 
Uh, if somebody hollers at you to tell you it's going to cave in, you will probably hear the first word out of their mouth and that is it. Um, after that, it only takes a split second for a cave in to occur. Uh, you will probably be underneath uh, several yards of dirt at that point. So uh, just something to look out for there. Give you some of the uh, facts that we have out there as far as deaths from excavation or trenching caves in, cave ins. Uh, this is just over the past several years. Uh, as you see, we started out 2011, 19, uh, went to 15 to 22 to 13. This is all over the country. And then we started to spike a little bit with uh, 2015, 2016, and kind of settled back down in 27, 28, and 17 and 18. Uh, I do not have the statistics for 2019 at this time. Uh, and as far as 2020 goes, I know that in the first nine weeks of 2020, I do believe we had eight fatalities across the country. So that was one a week that we were uh, on the move for at that point. So we need to make sure that we are paying attention when we are uh, in these trenches and excavations out there. All right, we talk about who's responsible for safety on the job site. All of the things that we look at, we look at safety managers. Are they responsible? Of course they are. Uh, they are part of the, the process out there on the job site to make sure that all their workers are safe in the, in the workplace and doing the right thing. We have competent persons out on the job site for various activities. Uh, those competent persons are responsible for safety on the job site. We have the employer uh, and everybody that uh, has anything to do with safety watching this, you all know that uh, basically it's the employer's responsibility to provide a safe workplace for their employees. So they are in that process also as far as responsibility. The employee themselves, uh, they are also responsible for safety on the job site, their safety, and they can also participate in the safety of others. They have coworkers that they uh, uh, are working with, uh, you spend more time on job sites than you do at home almost. So, uh, you know, just taking care of some of the employees that you're working next to is something that we, we should all take uh, pride in and do. So basically we're looking at everyone on site, individually and collectively. We wanna make sure that everybody goes home the same way they came to work. Uh, what I, I, I used to talk about with all your fingers, all your toes, and now it's basically you should only be eight hours older when you go home, eight, 10, 12, however many hours you work. Uh, but that's the only difference, a little bit richer and, and a little bit older as far as the eight hours. So, all right, we talked about the competent person in there and competent person is one of the things that uh, a trench and excavation is a requirement that we have. Every trench or excavation out there has to have a competent person uh, associated with it while it's being worked, while it's being dug, uh, while they're doing that work. So that competent person, if you look at what his requirements are and how he becomes one or she, uh, it is that they must be trained in soil analysis and protective systems. So basically you need to know how to classify soil uh, there's various types out there and some of you will uh, be running those through your head at this moment. Uh, there's also different protective systems that are used on job sites and excavation. So we need to make sure that we are uh, aware of that. And as competent persons, uh, they know these items uh, just like they know the back of their hand there. So we need to know the safety requirements. Where are we going to find the safety requirements? We find the, the safety requirements in the regulations. Uh, 29 CFR 1910. Uh, 650, 651, 52, and all of the appendices that go along with it, uh, those are your safety requirements. Uh, everybody that works in a trench and activation should actually read those requirements so that they know, but the competent person needs to be highly aware of those things. They need to be able to identify safety and health hazards. So they need to be able to tell if there's, you know, water in the hole, if there's sloughing off of the sides, uh, if we have uh, atmospheric conditions that may warrant uh, testing or people not to work there, if there's uh, other activities going on around the site that may cause problems for that excavation. So that individual needs to be able to identify those safety and health hazards. You also have to know how to correct those items. Uh, any one of those items that I just mentioned, there is a correction 
for those. Obviously, we're looking at if there's water in a hole, we need to be able to get it out or at least maintain it at that level until we can uh, remedy that situation. We need to be able to uh, fix the um, surcharge loads on the side of the uh, trench or excavation. So we need to be able to do those things and have that knowledge of corrective action. The main thing that this individual should have on that job site is authority. Uh, they should have the authority to make corrections, to stop the job, correct the problem, and make sure that this is not going to occur again. Uh, so that is their process for trenches and excavations as far as a competent person. And this competent person definition, uh, besides, of course, the soil analysis part of this, uh, applies to any other standard out there that would have a competent person associated with it. Some of the inspections and excavations we look at, obviously a competent person must make a daily inspection of that excavation. Uh, why do we do this? We wanna make sure that we're looking at those trenches and excavations at all times. We wanna make sure that our people are safe when they go down in those uh, trenches or excavations. So it's pretty much a constant monitoring. Uh, at the least, it should be before work starts. You should make sure that you are looking at this trench, seeing if you see any cracks or spoil piles or water coming in or uh, anything wrong with your shoring systems that maybe could have, could have occurred from the day before if you're still in that same trench or excavation. So those are all the things that we look at beforehand. Uh, any weather increasing event or hazard increasing event, it could be a rainstorm, high winds, uh, anything of this nature, we need to be able to inspect that trench again also. So if we're in there in the morning, say, and they have a thunderstorm roll through, uh, dumps a bunch of rain, we get, we've already gotten out and we're going to go back to work. So prior to going back to work at that point, we need to make sure that we take a look at the trench or excavation to see if it's, uh, uh, any hazards have, uh, shown their face to us at that point. When you can reasonably anticipate an employee will be exposed to a hazard. All right. So, uh, that's another why, reason why we do the inspections. Uh, we just kind of are exiting one of the worst times of the year for trenches and excavations. Uh, spring and fall are, are kind of two of the times that, that we really need to be careful in trenches and excavations because of the freeze-thaw effect that we have. Uh, every night we end up in the freeze district and then uh, during the day by noon we're up around 50, 60. Uh, so we need to make sure that at that point <clears throat> we are also taking uh, our view of the trench and, and doing our inspections properly so that we can see if any hazards have uh, popped up on us. All right, some of the unsafe attitudes that we see out there in the workplace. I've probably heard every one of these on a job site before if I am doing uh, an inspection or when I was doing inspections. Uh, these are excuses basically that people are making prior to, uh, you know, receiving citations obviously, but uh, the answers that we usually get from questions, you know, hey, I know what I'm doing. You know, it can't happen to me. There's a lot of people out there that believe they're invincible. Uh, you're not. Uh, it just hasn't had that opportunity yet to happen to you. So uh, be aware of that situation. Had people say they'd sleep in that hole. All right, we've got the don't worry. We'll watch the walls and tell you if you need to get out. If, if you are the person in the hole and you believe that statement, uh, I've got a bridge to say uh, uh, that's in New York uh, and I don't even own it. So we need to make sure that uh, before that word would come out of that individual's mouth of, hey, you would be buried by the dirt. So you would never hear the rest of that, that warning uh, telling you to get out. So we need to make sure that that is not our method of uh, warning system. Uh, the Last two here are probably two of the worst. They're two of the most uh, heard excuses that I've heard out there. And this could be for any accident, any fatality, any uh, inspection that I've done. Uh, one is that I've been doing it that way for years. It's the older gentleman, the guy that's been there 20, 30 years, uh, gentleman or lady, uh, that basically has been doing it one way or the wrong way for all of those times, but they refuse to change or they just don't know any better. And uh, they continue to do it that way. The, the bad thing about it is they are teaching younger workers the wrong way to do things. So then that younger worker gets caught up in these old ways 
uh, and then they potentially are the ones that are going to be uh, under the bottom of all that dirt when it caves in. Because at that point in time, who's the one going in the hole? The young new guy, they're the ones because the older gentlemen, the older people have already been in the, uh, been in that situation before for years. So uh, now it happens to be the younger guy going in. And last but not least, it's only going to take me a second. Uh, we've had several fatalities and several trench collapses that have occurred when a person is just meant to go into the trench for a second to pick up a tool, put a piece of pipe together, um, do any number of things, take a measurement. And it was only going to take that second to get that measurement. And as soon as they touched the bottom of that trench or excavation, the cave in occurred. Uh, and now they were underneath a cubic yard or however much dirt that they were underneath at that point. So let's make sure that we are not uh, utilizing any of these excuses out there in the workplace. Uh, that way we all go home safe. So some of the causes that we have of cave-ins out there, it could be the surcharge loads that we have out there. We've got excavators sitting right on the side of the excavation or straddling. Uh, you're putting a lot of pressure on that dirt uh, on that soil there to support you. Uh, we have spoil piles that are sitting directly on the side. Uh, the requirement of them being back off the edge two feet is there for a reason to prevent some of that surcharge load. Uh, we've got other things that could cause uh, cave-ins. Uh, we've got vibrations. There could be other tools or equipment on the side. Uh, the water in the hole causes the soil to become less cohesive. So at that point, uh, we're looking at some of the hazards that we may need to correct uh, prior to entering that excavation. So we're looking at this uh, cubic yard of soil, and I know most of you can probably tell how much this would weigh. Uh, a cubic yard of soil weighs approximately 3,000 to 3,200 pounds on average. And that's depending on what the soil is made of, what types of soil, the clay, the silt, the sand. Uh, it also depends on the moisture content, whether there's maybe some rock in it, things like this when you're weighing it. Uh, but on average, you're looking at that 3,000 to 3,200 pounds. They say being hit by this cubic yard of soil is like being struck by a small truck doing 40 miles an hour. And there's not many of us out there that could withstand that uh, that 40 mile an hour strike with a 3,000 pound uh, load of sand there. So uh, we need to be aware of that when we're in that hole. Uh, it's not forgiving and you're not going to dig yourself out of this when it occurs. So uh, this is a video that I'm gonna show. Uh, it is of a OSHA inspector in Oregon uh, who came up upon a group of individuals out doing some trench and excavation work uh, and it will show an actual cave-in that occurred. Uh, they filmed with a video camera their, uh, some of their inspections. Uh, in Maryland, we don't use a video for the most part. Um, we use everything basically with still picture. Uh, but this individual actually caught the collapse of a trench that occurred while he was trying to remove an individual from the trench. So you can look at all of the things that occurred and all of the things that are basically wrong with this trench as you're looking at it. So here's the, here's the video. Who's in charge today? Huh? Who's in charge today? How you doing? I'm in the state of Oregon, Oregon OSHA. Looks like you got a little bit of a shoring problem going on. Well, he can't be down there. Okay. Are you going to get him out? You want to see why he can't be down there? That's why he can't be down there. Okay, you got to get him out. And I, I hope you get him out soon.
guys been working here? Uh, about three hours. Okay. How deep are you there? About 21 feet. All right, so there's your video and uh, just some of the things that you may have noticed. Uh, obviously, you've got a guy in the hole uh, while they're actually installing the shielding or the shoring system. Uh, basically, you're looking at the ladder not in the hole. You saw how long it took them to put this ladder in the hole. So if there's an emergency and this individual needed to get out of there, uh, which actually at that point, there was an emergency. We needed to get him out. Uh, you could see how long it took them actually to get the ladder in there, stable enough for him to be able to get out. We're looking at uh, utilities being supported. And if it wasn't for that utility there, uh, he would possibly have been laying at the bottom of that box uh, underneath all of that dirt, or he'd have been knocked off of it and laying down in the bottom of that trench somewhere. So we need to be aware of those things. Uh, and the last answer that the individual gave you when you were listening to him when he said how deep is this uh he stated 21 feet so obviously at that point uh he was aware of how how deep they were digging uh but whether he was aware of what the requirements are of anything past 20 feet and beyond uh so we know that uh, at 20 feet and beyond there needs to be a professional engineer that designs the shoring system there so uh, that didn't truly look like a professional engineer designing anything in that situation. It seems like they were just trying to stack boxes as high as they could go and uh, put them in a hole. So there's your video there. Uh, we want to look at the excavation access and egress. Obviously, if you're looking at the picture here, uh, you see the step ladder in the hole. Uh, how many times have you seen people use uh, a ladder in that way? Uh, we should all know that a step ladder is not designed to be closed and leaned up against anything and used. It is designed to be opened up, locked in place uh, on a stable ground and used in that manner. Uh, plus, of course, we have to have the ladder extend three feet past the landing area and all this that uh, you see this ladder doesn't even come close. So some of the things we look at when we uh, do trenches and excavations, obviously stairway ladder ramp must be present in excavations that are four feet more or uh, deeper. So at four foot and beyond, we need to be uh, aware of where our ladder is and that our ladder is in the hole. We also need to be uh, aware that the ladder needs to be within 25 feet of the employees. So if I have a 50 foot long trench, the requirement is within 25 feet. Technically, I could do it with one ladder in the hole right in the middle. Um, my recommendation though, is that you put a ladder at each end wherever the employee is working. If there's more than one employee in that hole, put a ladder down where they're at and where they're working. Uh, don't just stick it in the middle of the hole and let them walk everywhere they want to. Uh, because at that point, you're gonna end up with uh, you know, congestion at the bottom of the ladder, people trying to get out, people trying to run 25 feet if they need to. Uh, just things like this may occur. So we want to make sure that the ladder is closer to the employees so they can get out or the ramp or the stairway. All right, and we need to be aware and make sure that that ladder is within the protected area. So if you're using the shoring systems and shielding systems, uh, then that ladder must be within those system. Uh, you should not have to exit your protection to access the ladder to get out of a excavation or a trench. So let's make sure that we are putting our ladders and our access egress inside the, uh, cont the containment there for the uh, shoring or shielding system. All right, for water in the hole, uh, we need to make sure that we are removing that. So, uh, or controlling it, we have to be able to control that water. We can't just let it fill up, fill up, fill up, and us go down in there and work. Uh, as you see these two individuals here in this trench, uh, basically it, it is a, uh, a mud pie that they're walking around in down there. Uh, and that alone will cause the sidewalls of that trench to soften up and be more susceptible to a cave in just by having that water in the trench there. So let's make sure that we are removing, uh, attempting to remove or controlling that water in the excavation if we're going to have anybody in there. So. We also talk about the uh, spoil piles. <clears throat> spoil piles need to be placed two foot or greater beyond the edge of the trench. 
So we want to make sure uh, that that is done. Um, sometimes uh, you may truck it out. You may dump all the spoil pile within a truck and, and move it out. Sometimes you may not have the room to do it or the need to do it or the, the vehicles to do it. So you just kind of pile it on the side, but you need to make sure it's, it's greater than two feet uh, from the edge of that excavation. Uh, one of the reasons too is you got your surcharge load there that you have on the side of the trench. Plus the fact if you are going to walk that trench and see, uh, do your inspection as a competent person, you're going to see probably some cracks or things like this that may occur within that two foot area. Uh, so that'll be a good way to be able to determine whether or not this thing has, uh, is susceptible to be, to caving in. So uh, let's make sure that we have our spoil piles away from the edge of the trench also. We talked about the classification of soil earlier. Uh, everybody knows there should be the four classifications. We have the stable rock. Uh, we have type A soil, which is uh, pretty close to rock, but it's a real solid clay uh, material that uh, is cohesive. It sticks together really well. It, it doesn't uh, soften up. It won't break if you try to do some of the tests, the ribbon tests and things like this that you try to do when you are testing soil. Uh, you have the type B, which is a little bit less cohesive. And obviously you have type C, which is probably the majority of the soil out there. Um, I personally have the attitude uh, or the mentality of, and I would like to see everybody else do, that uh, basically what you do out in your trench or excavation is you call it C, treat it as C, protect it as C, and everybody goes home just like they came to work. If you want to sit there and try to justify a B or an A and, and it's really not, but you're trying to justify it just so you don't have to go get a box or protect an employee, uh, you're not doing justice to the employee that's down there uh, trying, to, trying to get the work done for the employer there. So um, just a recommendation, call it C, work it as C, protect it as C, and you go home. So uh, that's just my little two cent on that. So we talk about some of the uh, caveman protections that are out there. There's three main methods that we utilize as far as caveman protection goes. Obviously we have sloping. Sloping may not be able to be utilized everywhere. It depends on the size of the property, how much land you may have, the depth of the hole. Uh, all of these things come into place when you're dealing with sloping. Uh, so that is one of the methods. We also have shielding. Uh, we have shielding that is uh, trench boxes, things of this nature. Um, and we also have shoring systems. Shoring systems can be utilized with hydraulic jacks and pneumatic jacks and screw jacks and um, other type shoring material that is used out there. Timbers, things like this. So these are the three methods that you use to protect yourself from a cave-in. All right, when you are protecting from cave-in, what depth are you needed to protect at? At five feet and greater, you need to be protected from cave-in and that is automatically, that is not uh, a, a questionable thing, that is automatic. Uh, the next uh, sentence there basically says, can be less uh, than five feet if a competent person determines it needs to. Uh, that is if it's say four feet, three feet, uh, maybe it's C-type soil. Maybe I'm down on my knees working, trying to put a pipe together, uh, take measurements, uh, do those type things. Uh, the competent person at that point will determine whether or not cave-in protection is required. Uh, even at a four-foot or a three-foot, if it caves in and you're on your knees, you're buried. You're not going to be able to move. You uh, have the potential at that point of uh, a fatality because of the cave-in. So let's make sure that we are utilizing everything within our power to, to bring people home safely in, in that manner. All right, some of the things that may uh, determine what type of protective system you use, uh, it's dependent on soil classification. There's different things you can do depending upon whether you're dealing with uh, A, B, or C type soil. Uh, we have the depth of the cut. Uh, that could determine what you're doing. As we saw in the video a while ago when he said 21 feet, uh, at 20 feet or deeper, you are required by the, re the regulations to have a registered professional engineer design your shoring system. 
All right, so that alone right there tells you what you need uh, for that system. The amount of water in the hole would also be able to uh, determine what type of shoring system you're using. Could be the changes due to weather, climate. Like I said, the spring, fall, thaws um, may determine, you may determine that hey, a trench box is safer than say a shoring system or maybe uh, nothing at all in a four foot hole. So we wanna put stuff in there that will protect the individual. Also what may determine it is dependent upon what other operations uh, are occurring in the vicinity. Uh, whether you've got uh, maybe somebody jackhammering or somebody driving vehicles, there's a roadway right next to where you're uh, digging your trench or, or excavation. So we wanna make sure at that point, the vibrations are not affecting what we're doing. So that may determine what type of protective system that we are using in that situation. If we're looking at the slopes, this right here will tell you kind of how the slopes are required to be. Uh, this comes straight out of the appendices in the standard, so it's telling you right there what, uh, what your slope should look like. Uh, if you are dealing with type A soil, uh, the slope will be three quarters to one, which is for every one foot down, it goes over three quarters. Uh, we also have the um, type B soil, which is a one to one for every one foot. Uh, up from the bottom, say, you go over one foot. Uh, that is for B, and obviously type C is even uh, greater of an angle. It's a one and a half to one sloping system. And if you look at all the, the symbols there, all the pictures there, they all have that 20 foot max right off to the side, the left-hand side there. Uh, that is in reference to the registered professional engineer again. Anything greater than that 20 foot, you must get the registered professional engineer to design it. You cannot use this way. All right, so then we go to the other system there that's utilized benching. And basically that is uh, a benching system is pretty close to a sloping system. It's just more of a stepped approach. Uh, and as you see the difference between the slide that I have here and the slide that I've showed before, uh, the slide before has an A, B and a C where the so slide here only has a type A or <clears throat> uh, type A and type B soil. So uh, you are not allowed to, to bench type C soil. Uh, unfortunately, we see a lot of people out in the industries there that think benching is, is acceptable in that situation uh, because it may be all they know. So they end up trying to bench a C type soil also. Uh, and it's just not cohesive enough for that activity. So. That's why we're looking at the type A and B because they're a little more cohesive and stick together a little better. So they're a little sturdier in that situation. We wanna look at uh, working under loads in the workplace also. Uh, make sure we're not look, working under anything. Uh, just in this picture, obviously we're looking at a uh, trench and excavation that is cut into probably a solid rock. It's probably a granite situation, stuff like that there. Uh, but we still have a, an excavator sitting over the top of three or four individuals that are directly over. And if that thing's running and it's vibrating the soil there underneath it, um, plus the fact the weight that is, uh, that excavator has, uh, we're talking tons of weight that is, that is potentially uh, going to cause that trench or excavation to cave in. Uh, so we need to make sure all of that material is backed away, make sure the excavator's not over the top of people. Uh, you're not lifting loads. Uh, we wanna make sure all of that is the case when you're out there in the workplace. Hard hats are required. That way uh, you're not being struck by anything, rolling off the side or being dropped uh, or falling out of the side. Uh, I think I did an inspection years ago where an individual was hit by like a cubic foot of dirt uh, that fell out of the side and it struck him in the side of the head and in the shoulder area, knocking him out in the bottom of the trench. Uh, he was kind of lucky and even though it shouldn't have been done this way, they kind of picked him up with the excavator bucket and lifted him out. Uh, because if they'd have waited for the fire department and the rescue department to be able to go in to get him, they would have had to secure the trench uh, put their cave in protection in. It would have taken them a couple of hours prior probably till they got everything fixed up to get down there to get him out. Um, but that is a situation that occurred. Like I said, hard hats required. Uh, we wanna make sure we're wearing them while we're there. <clears throat> I 
when we look at shoring systems, there's a lot of different shoring systems out there. Uh, as I talked about, we've got the hydraulic, hydraulic ones, uh, the pistons, we've got the pneumatic pistons, we've got the screw jacks or the mechanical type supports. Uh, we've got also timbers that can be used as cave-in protection. And if you were to uh, want to know how to install this timber shoring, uh, take a look at the appendices within the standard there. Uh, and they describe almost every activity you can use uh, up to that 20 foot mark that will allow you to uh, put your timber shoring in correctly, how it's supposed to be in and actually what type of boards are to be used for that system. Uh, we don't see a lot of the shoring or the timber shoring around much except for maybe in the city uh, where they're trying to do or go around pipes, uh, piping and things of this nature. Uh, most people will use the hydraulic or uh, a trench box type system. Uh, but if you're in the city and they're just kind of putting up stuff and trying to work around a uh, pipe and they might be there for a little bit, then they may end up putting up this system here. So uh, look at the appendices so that you know exactly how to put one up and what is required in that fashion. All right, this is just an example of what the trench uh, or hydraulic trench supports look like. Uh, we want to make sure we're using the proper jacks. We want to make sure that we are installing them correctly. Uh, as I said, there'll be a, uh, some diagrams within the appendices that will actually tell you how to install hydraulic shoring uh, or shoring of this type, whether it's uh, pneumatic or hydraulic or, or any of the other screw jacks type shoring. Uh, but it'll tell you where it should be located and what should be done with it. Uh, so let's make sure that we're looking at that also. Uh, we need to also make sure that we have our trench pins installed uh, or the locking pins for the pistons, uh, because if the piston were to fail, if it's a hydraulic or pneumatic piston, uh, that piston closes. And at that point, you now have no uh, support of the excavation walls. And that relaxation because of the pressure could cause something to cave in uh, at that time also. So we need to make sure that we are doing all of these, installing these correctly. Uh, they're installed from the top down and removed from the bottom up and nobody is to be in the excavation while these things are being installed. They should be installed first before you get in. All right, we just take a look at some of the, the shielding system, the trench box is probably the most common one out there uh, that we use. Uh, we wanna make sure the the trench box is there to protect the individuals in the trench. It's not there to support the walls where the hydraulic shoring systems all support the walls. Uh, they help put pressure on the walls to keep them from uh, caving in where the trench box is already set up and the individuals are protected due to backfilling and things like this that just makes the box snug in the hole. Uh, it's not there to really support the sides. <clears throat> All right, some of the shielding and safety uh, uses out there that we have. Uh, obviously, there's a manufacturer's tabulated data sheet that goes with every shoring system and, and every trench box. Uh, that must be on site. Um, while the trench box is being installed or built or constructed, uh, after that, it could be in the office. But uh, in the state of Maryland, we do require that to be there. So we're uh, could possibly issue citations on a, a tabulated data sheet not being on site for a trench box. So let's just make sure that we're uh, taking them with us in our paperwork and stuff when we go out uh, with our cut sheets and all the other things that we're required to have uh, with the trench or excavation. Uh, some of the other things we need to make sure that the top of the shield extends to at least the top of the trench. It can go higher than the trench top, but it cannot go lower. So it needs to be at least even with the top of the trench. All right, if it's used with sloping, if I use a trench box with sloping, then I need to be able to extend the trench box 18 inches above where the walls, the vertical cut wall begins to slope. I will show you a picture of that here in just a second that you'll have an idea of, of what that looks like. Uh, and that basically prevents the mat any material that could roll down the slope part of the wall from uh, falling into the trench and striking an individual. It will instead hit the top edge or the edge of that 18 inches uh, extension and it will stop right there. 
All right, shields may be stacked, provide the bottom one is rated for the total depth of the trench. So if we are digging a 16 foot trench and we have two eight foot boxes, we are good to go, but we need to make sure that it, at least one of those 18 foot boxes is rated for 16 feet. Uh, that is the information that you will find on the manufacturer's tabulated data sheet. It tells you how deep the trench or the excavation um, shielding box could be uh, within the trench. So let's make sure we're looking at those two. Trench may be dug two feet lower than the shield bottom, uh, but the shield also has to be rated for that depth. Uh, that is the, I've got a 10 foot hole with an eight foot box, or I put it in an eight foot hole and I need to dig two feet lower than the box. I am able to do that uh, by the regulations as long as my trench box, which is an eight foot trench box, is rated for 10 feet. So it has to be rated for the total distance of the, the trench or excavation, uh, but you can have that two foot uh, gap from the bottom of the trench to the bottom of the box. We need to make sure that we also back filling around the box to prevent any lateral movement. Um, get out there a lot of times and somebody will just stick the box in a hole. Uh, they don't back fill anything around the sides. And if something were to occur, a trench collapse, a wall collapse that may be forceful enough to push that box, uh, provide lateral movement to that box, then at that time you basically could, uh, could injure the employee underneath who could have been sitting right next to the box or, or standing in the bottom right next to it and the box raises up. And if the individual gets underneath that box and it comes back down, uh, it's basically going to either amputate something or pin somebody underneath uh, that box for the time period of uh, how long it takes you to get him out. Uh, so that is something that we need to make sure happens also is the backfill around the box to prevent the movement. Here's a picture that we talked about with the shielding and sloping. Uh, we have, uh, you got the straight cut, the vertical cut, and then we have the uh, uh, 18 inch raising above where the slope starts. Uh, as you can see on that picture, if anything were to roll down that slope, it would strike the side of the box, the outside portion of the box, instead of uh, rolling into the box to injure the employee in there. So it's just something we wanna make sure that we are doing if we're using this type of system. You see systems like this when maybe they, they have a little bit of room, but they don't have a lot of room. Uh, so I can't do a slope from the bottom of the trench out, but I can do one, say, eight foot up and then go out. Uh, I have that much room. So uh, it's just a system that's used out there for uh, varying type cave-in protection. All right, some of the stuff that, uh, that's, that's uh, a lot of our trench and excavation stuff. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit, like I said, about uh, some of our local emphasis programs and the trench and excavation, what caused us uh, to arrive and, and do our trench excavation uh, inspection. So uh, local emphasis programs are basically programs that MOSH has. Uh, Federal OSHA also has certain emphasis programs. They call most of theirs national emphasis. Uh, but we have local emphasis programs that are pretty much there for uh, high, high hazard activities, activities such as falls and construction, uh, electrical, these are the focus four type events. They're all uh, local emphasis programs. And that basically is a program that allows us to perform an inspection if any of these things are observed, all right? So we have uh, the potential for any of these things. We have fall hazards in construction, which is one of ours. We have electrical hazards in construction. We have the crushed by struck by hazards, uh, which the trencher excavations fall under. Uh, we have a tree care local emphasis program. Uh, we have a public sector local emphasis program, and we also have a Maryland high hazard industry program. Uh, so those are basically Maryland's local emphasis programs that we have out there uh, that we are utilizing to help perform inspections on areas where uh, the probability of injury or incident is very good. So we need to be aware of those. All right, uh, talk a little bit about the types of violations that we issue in the, in the workplace as far as MOSH. 
Uh, OSHA issues similar type citations and our citations go from other than serious, which is one of the more minor types. Uh, there could be a hazardous condition, but the chance of death or serious physical harm is not real good. It could be a paperwork issue or it could be uh, something else that just is, it could be serious, but it's not gotten to that point yet. Uh, maybe extension cord that doesn't have any uh, copper wire showing uh, things of this nature that, that we may be able to classify on the other than serious types uh, setting. Uh, so then we have a serious violation. Uh, serious are of substantial probability that death or serious physical harm could result from a condition that exists. Uh, most of the citations that will be issued for a trench or an excavation are considered serious in nature. Uh, one of the few that probably would not be would be for a uh, tabulated data sheet not being on site. All right. We may issue that as an other than serious, but uh, most of the other items uh, that are issued are issued under the serious tag or a greater tag if it's deemed that uh, it's necessary. Some of the other types of violations we have, we have a willful. Uh, uh, when you're looking at uh, the other two citations, we have the other than serious, the fines for that. Uh, it could be up to $7,000, but we in the state of Maryland have deleted other than serious fines um, to try to help employers out in that fact, we try not to, to break employers. We want you working. We want you out in the, the industry is doing your job. Uh, the serious violations are maximum $7,000. Uh, federally, they have gone up. Uh, they are just above 13 grand right now, I think, federal for the same violation in the state of Maryland, which is seven. So uh, they have changed theirs because of the cost of living and, and they've never had an increase in 45 years that they've been around. So uh, at this point, uh, they have tried to raise the penalties a little bit. So if you're in a federal state, federal regulated state, uh, that would be their penalties. We have a willful penalty. Uh, the intentional violation of the act or plain indifference to its requirements. It is the, uh, I don't care, I've got a job to do, get down there and do your work. Um, I don't care what you tell me, uh, or if an accident occurs and you've been told or you knew that, that the potential was there or you knew what the regulations required and you just decided you didn't want to do it anyway. Uh, so that's, that's another type of violation that we issue. Uh, maximum amount in the state of Maryland is $70,000 for a willful. Uh, federally, it's uh, 130000 a little over 130000 So uh, that's what you're looking at there for the willful. And for repeat violations, repeat violations are basically, if you have been cited within the last three to five years uh, in a particular citation uh, or part of the regulation there, say for a ladder not being in a hole, uh, and then you are receive another citation within that same time frame um, for a ladder not being in a hole, it will be, be deemed a repeat violation, which basically means it's a serious citation, a potential serious citation that you have done twice now. So the fines double. Uh, so whatever the fine would calculate out to be, we would double that fine for a repeat. If you have a third repeat, then it would be a quadruple, a fourth repeat, uh, six times. Uh, I think we have it up to eight times in our uh, uh, manuals that we uh, go by. But uh, by that time, um, you could potentially be getting a willful before you get the fourth and fifth type of repeats in this uh, case. So uh, those are just the type of violations that we issue in that setting. All right. So when talking about this, uh, this case that I'm gonna talk about, uh, the case began back on June 5th, 2018. Uh, that was when it occurred. A uh, company named RF Order was contracted uh, by the city of Baltimore to do some sewer line repair. Uh, they were trying to fix a sanitary sewer line at uh, Lake Clifton Pool. So, if we're looking at that, they do plumbing, heating, and air, things like this. They're a mechanical contractor, uh, but they had the contract with Baltimore City. And on June 5th, which is a Tuesday, this uh, occurred. Uh, it kind of began on a Friday where they started trying to determine where uh, the clog was. 
what they needed to do, all of the stuff they were going to, to have to do to be able to repair this uh, clog. Um, so at that point, come Monday, they started digging a little bit. They got uh, four to five feet deep, six feet deep or so within the excavation, but they still hadn't found it. So they broke for the day, came back on that Tuesday and began digging again. Uh, at 3.40, I received a call from the uh, assistant chief, uh, Keith Owens, uh, as I was driving home from work, that they had a trench collapse at the Lake Clifton Pool in Baltimore. Uh, I took the information down and immediately called two of my co-show inspectors, uh, Chuck Allen and Drew Dorbert, uh, to respond to that uh, job site. Uh, at 413, Chuck arrived on the site. Uh, they began the opening conference around 431. So that is the, the just of how it started. Um, where we were looking at here, this is the conditions that had happened that day and prior to. Uh, as I stated, we were, uh, they were fixing a sanitary sewer line. Uh, there were four employees on site with one subcontractor that was there for a little bit of time. Uh, there had been approximately four to eight inches of rain in the week prior to this excavation collapse. Uh, this was uh, most of you would probably remember in that June area there. I think it rained every day of the week for for a, a few weeks there. But uh, for that week before, we had four to eight inches of rain. So everything was pretty much uh, soggy. Uh, you could walk in the grass. I think they tried to drive a uh, uh, great all over towards the hole at one point, and it sank. Uh, into the, the ground. So they had to kind of yank it out with the excavator. They had to pull it back and, and take it out of there because they couldn't get it where they needed it. And the excavation ended up being uh, approximately, we don't have the exact measurements because they had done some digging after this collapse occurred uh, to try to get down in there a little bit better. Uh, so it was approximately 24 by 40 feet. Uh, and it was 15 plus feet deep. So you're looking at a pretty good um, excavation there. Uh, we're gonna look at the, uh, some of the pictures I'll show you uh, from the job site. Uh, this is one of the machines that they were actually using. They were jetting the line, which is basically they were going to send this line through the pipe uh, and it shot out high pressure water, which would cut through a clog and be able to unclog the line uh, for them. So that's what they were doing at the time is they were going to try to jet the line. Once they found the the end of the pipe that they could get to, they were going to run this up in there and clean out the line. So just an example of what they were using. This is the area uh, where the trench was actually dug. Uh, you see the four trees right there in front. It was similar to between the first tree to the left and the second tree in from the right. Uh, so it was in that area just behind those trees there. So that was where it was dug. Uh, you can imagine the, the hole there. Uh, this is where you can see some of the work had taken place. This was after the incident occurred. Uh, the manway there is the manway that uh, they utilized to determine how deep the line was that they needed to unclog and to determine where the clog was. So they ran a hose uh, or something down through that line uh, all the way to the clog and they were able to determine from the amount of feet they had on the, uh, the hose run through there, that was where the clog was. So that's where they started digging. So uh, this is just uh, some of the information that we had there. All right, this is the uh, Excavation, uh, after the fire department showed up, uh, they showed up to start to build their uh, trench box that they were gonna use their shoring system so they could get down in this hole and, and try to rescue this individual. Uh, if you look on the side where all of the fire department people are working, uh, that is the side where the wall collapsed, uh, right between the yellow hose there and the, uh, looks like a little green, Water hose, that is the area of the wall that collapsed uh, on the individual. So uh, this is the response right after it occurred. 
This is a, uh, another look at the hole from the other side of the, the road, uh, another look at the excavation. Uh, the individuals, if you look down in the excavation, you can see uh, some shovel handles and things like this that are sticking up. Uh, there's some uh, gloves laying on a, the side of the bank. Uh, this is where they were standing and where they were digging when this occurred. Uh, they were trying to uh, find out where the line was so that they could uh, do what they needed to do. All right, if you look right here, you see uh, in that area again, this is just the same picture of that area, and you can see the water coming through uh, the drain line there, the sewer line that they were trying to fix. Uh, it was still uh, running through at that point. Uh, so this is an area, if you look straight down between the water and the shovel handle on the left, uh, that is the area where the individual was working. All right, the uh, fire department uh, put their trench box uh, shoring system in the hole here, uh, determined about approximately where this uh, individual was standing at the time. Uh, and they put their box in the hole right where they thought they could uh, determine where the victim was and retrieve him. Uh, this uh, occurred early in the afternoon, probably, uh, I think I arrived on site around 515 by the time I got there with traffic and everything. I didn't get there till about 515. Um, so this was sometime around then uh, that they were able to start getting down in the hole to start digging and uh, finding what they need to, to try to get to. Obviously this is a uh, picture later on at night. This was probably closer to the 9, 10, 10 o'clock at night uh, area there. Uh, during the recovery event, rescue event, started out as a rescue, went to a recovery. Uh, but uh, prior, uh, during that event, it began to rain while we were out there. Uh, my hat's off are to all the fire department people out there. They uh, were continuous and diligent at digging and trying to locate uh, this individual, uh, the victim in this case. So, um, I have a whole new respect uh, watching those guys work continuously to try to recover this guy. Uh, his parents were standing there when I first arrived. They were probably within 100 yards of the, of the uh, uh, dig. And by the end of the night, uh, when this thing kind of got to be over, they were probably within about 40 or 50 feet before they decided that they needed to leave. They couldn't, they couldn't watch the rest of this. So... Uh, this is just some of the other uh, pictures that they had. All right, so basically we got a timeline there. 3.40, call from the assistant chief. 3.45, call the co-shows. Uh, at 4.13 p.m., uh, the co-shows arrived. Regional supervisor, I arrived. Uh, June 6th, they determined the location of the victim about 1.30 at night, and it took them two more hours before they were able to remove him. He was stuck in the mud. Uh, it was like soup in there. The fire department guys were sunk up to their knees. Uh, and we determined during our inspection, inspection that the individual that was buried was actually standing on a traffic cone in the excavation uh, to prevent himself from sinking into the mud any deeper than he was. Uh, as you see right there, the victim's name's Kyle Hancock. He was 20 years old. Uh, he was fairly new to the excavation industry or to this industry. He'd worked for the company uh, approximately a year or so. And he wanted to learn how to be a plumber. He, he thought that was one of the greatest jobs. When he first saw that happen, he, he just, that was what he wanted to do. So uh, it's a shame that he didn't get to fulfill his dream there at, at 20 years old. So, um, what we did after that is uh, we had a formal hearing with this um, case. Uh, citations were issued on November 9th, 2018. The hearing dates, we had several dates um, assigned for the hearing because the lawyer for RF Order came out of Illinois and had to have certain dates and do certain things. So the trial was not like one continuous trial. Uh, so you will see over the course of three months there, we had 14 total days. Uh, which were spent on the stand testifying in front of an administrative law judge and uh, our attorney, assistant attorney general. 
uh, with their lawyer. So uh, this is just the citations in the hearing phase of it. The citations that were issued, we issued uh, one citation, a serious citation for no hard hats. Nobody had hard hats. It became a total of $900. This is what happened in the, the court hearing. The administrative law judge decided she would affirm that citation. So that citation was carried on. We uh, went to the next citation uh, was no safe act egress. Uh, that was also listed as serious, but the judge reversed that citation, uh, determining that uh, we, they had a sloped side of the trench that they said they were uh, kind of accessing, but the sloped side had been already dug out since the uh, collapse occurred. But they reversed that citation. We had a training citation that was listed as willful, serious, and egregious. Uh, the egregious part of it basically uh, is in our uh, manual of how we do things. Our, um, it basically says that we can multiply the amount of the fine by either the number of people um, that were exposed. So we multiplied the fine by four because there were four people that were not trained in excavations. Uh, so that's how that uh, ended up at $122,000. Uh, it was also affirmed. Uh, the next one was water accumulation in the hole, willful serious again. Uh, the judge reversed that because uh, she determined, I guess, that they had uh, tried to do something with the water or cause a trench or a, a little runoff somewhere to get it out of their way. Uh, so she reversed that one. Uh, the next one was an inspection by competent person. We classified that as willful serious also because uh, we didn't determine a, a competent person was there, nor was an inspection done. Uh, that was affirmed. Uh, we also had cave in protection. There was zero cave in protection. Uh, was cited as willful serious and egregious. And we cited that because there were uh, three people that were uh, exposed to no cave in protection. That was affirmed and also we had the develop uh, equipment training program uh, for every employer that operates a piece of equipment that moves dirt, things of this nature. They have to have a training program in place um, for the operators. Uh, so they were listed as another and serious because it's a program type thing. That was affirmed and the last one was a written description of the program. They didn't have that uh, and that was affirmed also. So there's where our citations ended ended. We had eight citations, two serious, four willful serious, two other than serious, and they were basically a total of uh, $277,050 uh, was the original penalty that was fined. Uh, what occurred after the administrative law hearing uh, was eight citations. We had two of them reversed and six of them affirmed for a total of 245,500. So they took the amount of money off of the penalty uh, for the two that were reversed. And that case right now is heading to what we call a commissioner's review. It's the next step in your uh, process of, um, if you want to uh, contest those violations. So it is under the review right now. The uh, COVID-19 uh, incident has kind of cut into that. It was supposed to have already been done, but it, as soon as the, they were ready to start this and I think the end of March or so when everything shut down. So uh, I'm not sure what the, the uh, ending of that commissioner's review is at this moment. I don't, do not believe it has been completed at this moment. All right, so what do we have here? We've got uh, employers are supposed to provide a safe and helpful workplace free from recognized hazards. Uh, everybody understands that is basically the um, general duty clause, all right? You have to know and follow motion OSHA standards. You have to provide training and medical examination and maintain all records uh, and not discriminate against any workers who exercise their rights under motion or, or the OSHA Act. Uh, that's basically if they uh, have a problem with uh, something in the form of safety and doing their job, uh, they are protected under the law. All right, employees' responsibilities. Obviously, we need to make sure we follow the OSHA standards, uh, safety, any safety rules that the employer may have, uh, best safety practices for the job, 
uh, any manufacturer's uh, regulations, anything like that, uh, they need to be able to be followed also. Uh, report hazardous conditions to your supervisor or safety committee if you have them. Uh, report hazard, hazardous conditions to most if employers do not fix them. So that's our complaint system that is available to employers or employees if uh, your employer decides not to provide you with a safe place to work. All right, so the next couple of slides are just kind of some general information slides. Uh, I'm not gonna go over them, but there are contact slides for you if you ever need to contact anybody from Mosh. Uh, they'll be there. Uh, any kind of complaints, uh, I'm the Region 3 supervisor, so my number is down here also. Uh, I am more than happy to uh, assist you in any way that I can. If you have questions on regs or anything, uh, just give me a call and I'll be more than happy to, to give you an answer. I'd rather do that uh, prior to an incident than having to try to explain to you after the incident why you're going to receive citations. So uh, those are just numbers that you could call and we have some other uh, links here that you could actually get to in a different area. So uh, that's pretty much the presentation. Uh, if you have any questions, I guess uh, Deb's going to jump in and uh, start taking questions if we have any. Yes. Can everybody hear me? Tom, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, cool. All right, everybody. My name is Debbie Jennings. I'm with the Chesapeake Region Safety Council. And um, in the chat, you may have seen that we asked if you had suggestions for future webinars to send them to me. My email is debbie at chesapeakesc.org. In addition, just so you know, I'm going to try to share my screen. Um, Mike, you're going to have to take it back from Tom. Or Tom, you're going to have to turn it over to me. All right, let me try it again. Yes. That's not working. This. Okay, so for those of you that um, are uh, OSHA oriented, and it seems most of you are on this call would be, uh, here are virtual classes that are coming up in the next two months, and you can find them on our websites, either the chesapeakesc.org or the oshamidatlantic.org sites. Tom, we have about a dozen questions, sure. and I'm going to lead uh, you through them, and you can just let me know whether or not you've already answered it in your presentation, because they came um, in as you were talking. Okay. So the first one is, does the competent person need a certification for soil analysis or does experience satisfy OSHA's requirements? No, they do not have to have a certification in it. Um, you'll find a lot of companies out there that may say, uh, okay, we're gonna send you somewhere to, to be a certified competent person. So you get your cards and things like this. Uh, there's nothing in the regs that say you have to be certified in it. What you have to do is be competent, knowledgeable, uh, your experience and time and service could, could give you that uh, as long as your employer um, evaluates you and determines that you are what you say, you know, what he's going to classify you as and gives you the authority. So, Okay, and I think that actually answers a few other questions that we had. Um, does the competent person have to be on site for the full period of time that there are people in the excavation? Yes, automatic. Okay. Um, does the shoring or shielding need to be at the height of the trench? Yes, that was answered in the in the presentation, but yes, it will. It has to be at least even with the top of the trench. Okay, um, this might be a little too specific or it might have been answered already. What are fall protection requirements at the top of the trench at the trench edge with a trench greater than six feet? The only fall protection uh, that they talk about within the trench standard, the trench and excavation standard, is fall protection if you are going to travel from one side to the other. Uh, say if I uh, lay a ramp down or lay a uh, board down or something and try to cross over the trench or excavation, at that point, if it's deeper than six feet, I need to be protected from falling into. Uh, there's nothing in the trench standard that talks about the sides and things of this nature. so. Uh, obviously, you want to at least evaluate it. Um, just because it doesn't talk about it doesn't mean you don't need to at least look at it and determine whether or not you can do something to assist. 
Uh, it's better to, to protect the individual than not protect them, so. Okay, sorry, I'm trying to also mute my desk phone. Um, do any of the tech violations, do any of the violations include jail time? Uh, no, not at this moment. Uh, none of these were filed as criminal. Uh, the potential for this to occur uh, could happen. I mean, but, but at this moment, none of these are, were considered as a criminal type event. Uh, I think I just read something the other day about somebody in Michigan or Illinois or something like that, though, that uh, just received jail time uh, for a trench fatality. So uh, the possibility is there if you're the, the foreman or superintendent or owner of the company. So. Okay. Um, and what are your thoughts about Shotcrete and mesh shoring systems? I would say if they're evaluated by the by an engineer, um, I'm not going to deny what an engineer would say. I mean, their their uh, education and and stuff is for that purpose. Um, they'd have to be able to provide me with the documentation that says it would be adequate. Uh, but if those things are determined adequate by the professional engineer and stuff, then we'll, we'll accept. Okay. Um, there are a few about trench boxes. Uh, when a trench box is used, are the ends of the box required to have metal plates or must they slope to the ends of the excavation? I would say either or. You need to be able to remove that hazard and the ends of those boxes. If I stick it in that hole, the ends of the boxes are open. Uh, you need to be able to put something down on that end to prevent the, the ends from caving into the, the box. Okay, um, next one. If trench boxes are designed to be stacked in a trench that is 20 foot or greater, the trench boxes are already engineered, correct? So a separate registered engineer document would not be required. False. We would ask for a professional engineer's cave in protection or shoring system design uh, at that point. We would want to see that. Not just the paperwork that says, hey, this box can be put at 20 feet. Okay, so um, for those of you that may have extra questions, and I see them popping in, if you wouldn't mind sending them in an email to debbie at chesapeakesc.org, we'll get them to Tom. Um, and uh, it was nice to see everybody's comments in the chats. Many of them we know are already our existing customers and you know uh, attendees in our classes. If this is a new experience for you all working with us, feel free to drop us a line. We'd love to know where you're coming from and if there's anything we can do to help you. And Tom, once again, um, you've managed to put together a great presentation in our new environment for you and one that's evolving for us too. Um, obviously with the number of attendees, I know we were right around 350 the last time I looked. Um, you've, you've got a great audience here who really has uh, the need for what you're sharing and so I appreciate it. And on behalf of Dave Medeiros and the Chesapeake Region Safety Council, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Y'all take care. Call us if you need anything. <laughs>